Hey, good morning. Let's, let's stand together. Light that burns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. There is a love that sets our hearts ablaze. Sing that together, there is a light. There is a light that burns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. There is a love that sets our hearts in We're on our knees Let there be a heart beat We need this offering Oh, come to this place Father, we're crying out Spirit, we need you now Glorious love surrounds us Oh, come to this place King. There's a king that reigns in victory. There's a mercy strong enough to save. If you rise enough from the ashes, there's a love that overcame the grave. We're on our knees With every heart feeling We need this offering Lord, come to this place Father, we're crying out Spirit, we need you now Glorious love surrounds us Lord, come to this place I will worship you, I'll worship you, I'll worship you always, and I will worship you, Lord, I'll worship you, oh, I'll worship you always, I will worship, I will worship you.
Father, on our knees, and with every heartbeat, we bring you this offering. Lord, come fill this place. Father, we're crying out. In spirit, we need you now. Glorious love surround us. Lord, come fill this place. Come fill this place. It's already to his blood it's once for all the father gave the son forever we are changed by the miracle of grace throughout history the father's life remains phrases rise
Come thou fount of every blessing, turn my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. O oh, to grace, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a feather, by my wandering heart to be. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Stuart, go ahead and lead us in prayer. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, open up our minds and our hearts to know how much you truly love us. Lord, that we would be assured of that love uh, by just looking to the cross and knowing in our hearts and our minds uh, that you gave everything, that you, uh, you shed your blood for us, you, you gave your life for us so that we could truly live. Lord, that you were not willing that any should perish, but that you gave your life for all. Lord, it's so hard for us sometimes because we we think we have to do things and be in a certain way, and Lord, you've already taken care of all of that. Help us to find our rest in you. Help us to find our peace in you, our purpose. Help us to know that um, there are glories forevermore in your presence, that you are the one that have all that we need. Help us to dwell on that. Please be with Tom today and fill him with your spirit. Give him your words, your thoughts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming out. You look great today. You feel great? Well, if not, you're, you're going to get there. Um, I'm so glad you came. If you hung with us for a while, you know we used to do like message worksheets. Well, they're back. Um, if anybody did not get one, uh, please look. I, I snuck some on, on your seats near you. Um, so if you need one, please tell me. There you go. Uh, these have all the scriptures and, and the main points in them. And that way uh, you can remember it and you can have those and 
uh, you can take notes for yourself. And we just want to give you tools to, uh, to help you get the most out of your time here. Okay, um, tomorrow night, right here, we're, right here, actually, where I'm standing, uh, at 7 o'clock, we have a prayer meeting. And we are going to call on God for anything uh, in the world, actually, anything that you need. Um, I want you to know we have a place and we can come. We're going to call on God. We're going to watch Him in faith do more than we can ask for or imagine. So uh, if you want to join us here, 7 o'clock tomorrow. Okay, now uh, you may have noticed that I am wearing a rather attractive neon safety vest. One size fits most. Apparently, I'm not most, but uh, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, everybody, every one of the 30 people who signed up last week to volunteer for the Easter gas buy-down will get an opportunity to wear one much like this. You're saying Easter gas buy who be whaty? Yes, let me tell you about it. On Easter Eve, which is Saturday, April 16th, the day before Easter, we are partnering with a locally owned uh, gas station whose name you know, but I'm not, uh, we're, we're going to give you more information on that. And for the hurting people of our town, we're going to get them to turn all their pumps back a uh, dollar cheaper for two hours from 10 till noon and invite anybody who needs some relief to come and fill up. And then we go to the station right after we finish and write them a check for a dollar per gallon for everything that's been pumped. So they are kept harmless. But we are going to bless people and, and do that. You said, I didn't know that I would get to wear a vest like Tom. Well, where do I sign up? Right here, right here. Because of the so many people signed up, we're just going to do one-hour shifts. Uh, so you don't need to be there from 10 till noon. It would be either 10 to 11 or 11 till noon, right, except for our team captains, and we're going to be doing everything for these people. We're going to just like throw a party, and here's a sample of that air freshener that I talked to you about, Bethany logo, traveling prayer, smell it. Oh, it smells like vanilla. Do you like that? You should, because this is what heaven smells like, okay? Uh, get used to it. All right, well, it's just going to be great. Let me take this off because uh, it's silly. Um, we had talked about this for a little bit of time, and uh, we said that it's going to cost us uh, between four and five thousand dollars to be able to extend this blessing to the community. And if you were worried about that, worry no more. I am going to say something that I seldom, if ever, say: Please stop giving. Please stop. No, not just in general. Just please stop giving to the Easter gas buy down because. Thanks to God and thanks to the generous people of this church, we have far exceeded the goal. Keep giving, uh, please, uh, to the ministry because whatever we receive, we just pray about, God, what do you want to do? What do you want to do for these people? What do you want to do for the people who are far from you? What do you want to do for the people who are hurting? So, so keep going, but um, look, I don't know who you are, but you know who you are. And God knows who you are, most importantly, and he will bless you for what you've done. But we're, we're more than there. So praise God for that. Easter is coming, and we have so many baptisms, like nine. <laughs> it's crazy. It's wonderful. Uh, so who are you going to invite to come with you to Easter service who might, who would not otherwise be here? Who said the Holy Spirit? That's not, that's not fair. That's not right. No, who are you going to ask? There's a place on your worksheet about that. Who are you going to ask? Start praying about that now. Let me tell you, in America, unchurched people, if you ask them to come with you to Easter service, 80% of them will say yes. Those are great odds. I would play those odds every day and twice on Sunday. So do it. Do it. Because we want everybody to know how much God loves them, right? And we want heaven to be crowded. And so uh, there are some friends who need some good news in their life. Who are you going to ask? Uh, today, we have week five of Body Armor. I'm so glad you're here. We're going to ask God for help, and then we're going to dig in. Lord, you are so good. 
you are far better and far more loving and far more glorious and far better to us than we know or appreciate. And today, I'm asking you to let us all hear from you. Nobody needs to hear from Tom. We, we need a word from you, Lord, that cuts through all the junk and changes our mind and our heart and our lives and our eternities. And Lord, you say you gave us a, a helmet to protect our minds. Uh, and that means that we're going to take some headshots. But you have provided for us. We ask you to protect us and, and be big in this place, in this time, and be glorified in Jesus' name. Okay, uh, we're going to go. Uh, we are in Ephesians chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, open them up to there in Ephesians chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible and you wish you did, Look under one of the seats in front of you for one of those hardback Bibles. And if you're in that, you want to flip to page 1125. That's where we are. Uh, and if you don't own a Bible, guess what? You do now. That one's yours to keep free. So we want one in every home, every heart. Okay, we're going to pick it up in verse 10. And this is the whole context for the whole Body Armor series. Here we go. Ephesians 6.10, finally... Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. This is superhero, superpower, strong to the max, right? That's what you got. Put on the whole armor of God, or put on God as your whole armor, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. That's right, against it, because he's, he's, he's wanting to, to distract you and lie to you. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Let's pause there. This grand social experiment that happens all the time in our culture under every administration, every way, is not making the world brighter and better. Right? It's making it darker. And if you doubt that, just leave the house. Right? And, or just look. I mean, you'll see it. There's hopelessness, there's darkness, there's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. When is that? Today, right now, always, until Jesus comes back. And having done all, to stand firm. That was week one. Now, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, that's week two, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's week three. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Good new shoes. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. You can because he can. Right? That was week four. And this is what we're going to go on and take up the helmet of salvation. Let me, let me just say, if you have been traveling or you've been busy or you haven't been with us, and look, uh, go to the Bethany website or get, get, go on the Bethany app. Or if you don't have either one of those, go on YouTube. I know you got that. Search Gunnison Bethany and all of these messages are there. Why? Because I want every part of you covered with the grace of God with the protection of God. I don't want you going out into your life and getting shot at and not protected. Okay? So catch up if you, if you haven't been. But today we're looking at verse, the beginning of verse 17. And take up the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Now, we have a couple of uh, people who have lent me some things. And this is not the helmet of salvation. This is actually a SWAT helmet, and it will take around to your cabeza, to your noggin, and, and deflect it, uh, although you'll probably get a big headache. Um, I don't look like a warrior of God right now. I look like a goon. You might say I look like a, a green Q-tip. But uh, this is to show you that just as in the military, it's important for us to have head protection right, from bullets, from uh, shrapnel, from knives, from anything else, that spiritually it's important that we wear the helmet of salvation. Now, as we said, this is to protect your head, your mind. Now, your 
thought life, right? It protects you. What is in there? What is in your internal hard drive? Well, the things you know, the things you've heard, the things you've learned, the things that people have said about you, the things that you feared, all the things that you focus on, everything that you've experienced that you remember, everything that you play over and over. And do you know those? Do you know those tapes or those recordings that keep playing? And some of them are good and some of them are bad. What does your internal hard drive look like? For some of us, it looks like a giant warehouse that is impeccably organized. And then, for others of us, it looks like a ginormous junk drawer with unwrapped uh, gum and spare change and keys that open stuff that, that you don't know what it opens. And here's an almond. What did that? And an empty bottle of Tums or whatever it is. But whatever it looks like, it needs to be protected. If you don't protect your mind, bad things happen. Now, what do you call a motorcycle driver, a motorcyclist without a helmet? An organ donor. That's right. That's right. Now, I know nothing against motorcyclists. It just says we got to protect our heads. We got to protect our minds. Now, I know more about this than I wish that I did. Um, Coming up, like about five and a half years ago, uh, I had what's known as a TBI. Now, that does not stand for Tom Burgraff Incapacitated, although it might as well. It stands for Traumatic Brain Injury. And some of you are going, oh, well, that explains a lot. Yeah, well, uh, and I will tell you that it is very important that you protect your mind. And what happened was I had a subdural hematoma, which is brain bleeding between your brain and the dura, like the the film. And and the pressure builds up. And I ignored it for five weeks because, well, I'm a guy. And that's what you do. Um, And then I ignored it until it was unignorable um, by me and everybody else who cared about me. Uh, And I don't often talk about how it happened, right, what the blow to my head was, because it wasn't very exciting. I did not go skydiving or Rocky Mountain climbing or go 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. I did not. I cracked my head getting into Cherie's truck. Not very glamorous, but it did the trick. What I've learned is that it's very important that you protect your mind that you protect your brain because it took me an awful long time to work through and get rid of the cobwebs and the darkness and it's still something that I have to be diligent about. So it's important and I know it's important. Every one of you has a thought life. What is a thought life? It's what you focus on. We refer to this, the messages, the lies, the promises, the hopes, the happenings, the memories, the fears. It's what you focus on. It's what you dwell on. You ever use that word dwell on? It's perfect. Because dwell is not just focus on or zero in on or zoom in on. Dwell also means where you live, right? It's the reality that you live in. So it's it's important that the things that we dwell on be healthy, right? Because your thought life in one sense, dictates your whole life. And you know this. You know this because you have been to some of the most gorgeous places doing some of the most exciting things ever. But if your mind was negative and dark in that place doing that thing, you were still miserable. Conversely, Sometimes you've been in very ugly places or very humble places doing mundane and boring things. But if your thought life was good and godly and glorious, you were filled with joy even in this place doing that. And and, and some of you have been through some really dark times in your family, with your parents, in your own lives, with your relationships, right? And losing people and things like that. And that's hard. But chances are 
that part of what you were struggling was with was not just what was happening to you, but what was happening in you, right? And the darkness of your thoughts made that darkness that you were going through doubly dark. And it's not to deny the difficulty of those situations, but to show you how important it is that we keep our minds, our brains, our thought life protected. And the Bible tells us to do this. The Apostle Paul writes, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, things that break the heart of God. But those who are controlled by God the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit, that give God joy, that give you joy. It goes on. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. Death of joy. Death of peace. Death of death of us. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads you to life and peace and joy and hope and all of that. God is saying that the matter of what or who controls your mind and your thought processes is literally a matter of life and death, of joy and despair. And the question is, who controls your mind? Do you just accept whatever comes to you or do you let God control your mind or does does your mind, does your thoughts feel out of control? Well, that's what we're talking about. That's the important. The battle for your life, for the joy, for your faith, for truth, it all is won or lost right here. Right here in your mind. Why is that true? Because your mind, your thoughts determine your feelings, which determine your words and actions, right? The mind, which, you know, the Bible often uh, often talk about your heart and your mind interchangeably, but your your thoughts determine your feelings, determine your your words and actions. And we know this because we have all felt ways that we did not want to feel. You ever felt a way you did not want to feel? And you say to yourself, I don't want to feel this way. I want to feel a different way. So I'm going to try to feel that way. And how, how is that working? It don't work. It doesn't work. Because we're not getting to the root of the issue. The root of the issue is what we dwell on, what we keep replaying, what we think about, and whether that's God-centered or problem-centered or lie-centered, or right? It doesn't work. And, and it, it happens with behavior too. What, what kind of behavior have you wanted to change? Uh, I want to eat less. I want to party less or drink less. I want to, um, I want to be kinder. I want to be um, more sympathetic. I want to be more studious. What we, I want to work out better. I want whatever that is, right? And you try to change that. And for the most part, the reason that we have New Year's resolutions every New Year is because uh, it works for a little bit and then we seep back into the way that we were. Why? Because we're treating the symptoms and not the disease, right? We've got to get underneath it, not to what we do and say, not to what we feel, but to what we think. And what, whether God is in control of what we think, or the world is, or the enemy is, or it's just whatever comes, right? We've got to know. And um, the Apostle Paul tells us this. Finally, brothers, finally, sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What's worthy of praise? Jesus. All of these things describe Jesus. So focusing on Him and His promises and His presence and His nearness and His knowing that He thinks of you as His favorite woman, as His favorite man, as His favorite child, because you're in Christ, right? Thinking about that and rejecting all the other things. That's what it means. And that's what we have to do. In this spiritual battle, I want you to understand that we need to stand guard. Where? At the gate of your mind. We need to stand guard in the power of God at the gate of your mind and only allow in those thoughts which bring Him joy and glory, which will bring you joy and peace and glory and love and all that. And reject any lie, any thought that breaks the heart of God, that accuses you of something He's already forgiven you for, right? I will guarantee this thought has played over and over 
and over. You are worthless. You are unloved. You are rejected because you did this. This is who you are. Do you refer to yourself as you? No, you don't. You refer, you, 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 you refer to yourself as I. That means somebody else is saying it to you. Who would say that to you? The enemy? Who can't take away your forgiveness, but can do the next best thing. He can keep you from walking in the joy and the freedom of the incredible, complete forgiveness that is yours in Jesus Christ. You are not any of those things. You are washed clean. That's what it means. Okay? And that gives us enormous peace. Take a look at the Word of God. You keep Him. You keep her. In what kind of peace? Perfect! Which means it can't be uh, improved on. It can't be added to. It's, it's overflowing. It's perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he, because she trusts in you. So the more that we think about the things of God, about the promises of God, about the peace and the, and, and the love of God, the more we trust him and the more God is in charge of keeping us in perfect peace. That's why it's so important that we guard in Christ the gateway to our minds, right? That's the importance of wearing a helmet, but this is a very specific helmet. We talked about the importance of protection, but this is very specific protection. What did Ephesians tell us? That take up and put on the helmet of salvation. This is the helmet of assurance of salvation, right? The, how can that protect your thought life in a way that nothing else can? Say assurance of salvation. You'd be amazed. You would be amazed. What does that mean? I have to live perfect? No. You have to trust and believe in the one who lived perfect for you. Right? That's what it means. And if you know that you have received Jesus Christ, if you've received his, his gift of, of living perfect for you, dying for the imperfection in you, and rising again to give you complete forgiveness and ever-increasing life, that gives you assurance, and that can protect your mind, and that's what we're going to talk about. Assurance of salvation is knowing that you know that you know that you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have been saved, right? Now, if you ask most people what that means, they will tell you, here's what it means. It means that the day that I die, I do not need to worry about my internal destiny. That has been set by Jesus. I'm going to be with him in heaven. I'm not going to be separated from him in a place that the Bible calls hell. That's not going to happen because of what Jesus did for me. Not because I lived good enough, right? Not because I went to church enough. Not to, because of him, what he did. And that is true. But that is falls so short of the depth of how assurance of salvation protects your mind and your body and your thoughts and everything else. And we're going to show you practical ways in which that does that. Now, most people you would talk to, whether they're churched or not churched, or religious or non-religious, or know their Bible or not, if you ask them, when you die, do you think you're going to go to heaven? They would. Most people will tell you, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure I am because, look, I'm a pretty good person, and I know some pretty bad people. And if God grades on the curve, like I'm pretty sure he does, and he weighs these things out, I think that he's going to cut me some slack and kind of green light me in. I, I think that's probably how things are going to work out. You know anybody like this? They, would you ever think this way? Well, no shame. I mean, that's how many people think that they would run Heaven's admission program if they were in charge. But the truth is that that's not how God runs it. And we got to give Him that because when it's your house, it's your rules. And we understand that, don't we? Right? Have you ever gone into a house, is this the, the situation when you go home, that you take off your shoes when you come in the house? Do you do that? Anybody? Anybody's house like that? <clears throat> I get it. I mean, I get it. Take off your shoes before you come in the house. It's a little awkward for me because I don't wear socks, so you like pick your poison, right? 
But I understand why people who do that do that. Because they're, they're trying to keep their house clean, right? And if you wear your shoes from, especially during mud season in Gunnison, from the outside into the inside all over the place, then you bring all the dirt and grime and germs that were outside into the otherwise clean house, right? I get it. Now, imagine that it's not a clean house, but it's a perfect heaven. It's not clean. It's 100% pure. It's 100% perfect, inhabited by a holy God. Now, take off your shoes before you enter in. It starts to make sense, right? Because if you don't, all the grime and, and dirt and all the stuff that's in the world will eventually make heaven dirtier and dirtier until it looks just like what we're supposed to be delivered from. But here's the problem. What if it wasn't our shoes that we need to take off because that's where all the stuff is? What if it's inside us? And it is. How do we deal with that? Well, God's got a choice to make. He can either relax his standards like so many other people, but then heaven wouldn't be heavenly and God wouldn't be holy, right? And heaven would look just like the things that break our hearts and break his heart here on earth. So you can't do that. But what is the other choice? Well, you can just keep out everybody who's got this dirtiness inside them, but that would be you, me, Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, everybody else who's ever lived except Jesus. And that breaks his heart because he created you, because he loves you, and wants a love relationship with you that, that extends forever. So what is God to do? The only thing that God could have done, and it's brilliant, it's called the gospel. It's the centerpiece of our faith. God decided to put this on himself. So he comes to earth in Jesus Christ, Right? He puts skin on, lives the life that we should have lived but don't, dies the death penalty that every one of us deserve, but does it in our place for our sins on the cross as our substitute. And then he rises again to give us his new, increasing, eternal, bulletproof life. That's what he does. And in this way, because you have been cleansed by the suffering, by the blood of Jesus Christ. God can welcome you in as his favorite daughter, as his favorite son, into a perfect heaven because you've been perfectly forgiven. So he upholds his holiness and his standards and celebrates his great love for you. That's salvation. So when we put this helmet of salvation on, we let every piece of that inform, infect, transform every thought that we have. And it becomes beautiful. Let me ask you, do you have that? Do you have that assurance? You say, oh no, I'm not good enough. I don't care. Here's the thing, God doesn't care. None of us is good enough. That's why he came. It's a gift. Have you received it? Do you know that you know that you know that you know that he's got you now and forevermore? And if you don't, that's okay because you're in the right place because he wants to change that this morning. How does the assurance of salvation protect our mind and our thought life? Again, most people would say, well, I don't have to worry about where I'm going to spend eternity. Well, yes, but that falls so short of the wonderful, mind-blowing things that, are, that also make true, that transform your, your mind, your thoughts, your peace. And there are so many incredible ones, but we only have time here today to go through five of them. I'm going to put together a, a longer list of, of things and scriptures to go with it, and it'll be on the Bethany app, and, and we'll get it out to you. Um, but for this morning, we're just going to look at five but it even gets better than this. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe, it means trust in everything in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not you might be, not, uh, you know, roll the dice, take a chance. No, no, you will be. He wants you to have this assurance. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Number one, 
if we put on the helmet of salvation with the assurance of salvation, you can now live from acceptance, not for acceptance. And you do not have to be anxious. That's good news. This is huge because almost all of us, everything that we do, everything that we say, everything we post on social media, everything that we prepare to look like, and I want you to see me this way as, as beautiful and chiseled and attractive. I want the, all of that, right? I want all of that. So everything I strive for, everything I work for, everything I try to earn, everything, um, everybody I hang out with, the way I relate to them is meant to earn or gain acceptance from other people. And it, for them and for us, is crushing and suffocating. And even change yourself. You'll change yourself if you think it's going to get you more accepted. But with the assurance of salvation, with the helmet of salvation on, you know that you have been totally accepted by the God of the universe. And when you have that assurance, how much do I have to play for your acceptance? Or can I just deal with you authentically and lovingly? Right? It sets you free in radical ways. And Jesus said this, all, all people that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, whoever, I will never cast out. Do you know what that means? That your acceptance when you come to Christ completely now and forever, from the top of your head to the bottoms of your feet and everything in between, He completely accepts you. And that comfort can keep you at peace and not have to live for the acceptance of others, but from the acceptance of God. And, and remember when I talked about that guilt for which you've been forgiven? No. You've been totally accepted, totally forgiven. Be at peace. What else? What else does salvation and the assurance of salvation, the helmet of salvation, do for us? Number two, you can live similarly from love, not for love, and, and not be insecure. Insecurity is a big deal. It's a big deal for us because we spend pretty much all of our lives trying to get people to love us. And we know we want to love other people. And if our uh, love cup, I want you to picture a cup, right? If it's, it's kind of like our gas tank. If it's half or more full, then we feel like uh, we can love our boyfriend or girlfriend or our friends or our spouses or uh, our children or uh, our coworkers or our teammates pretty well, pretty well. But there are days when they're just not coming through for us. Right? We're not feeling the love, and our love cup is, is like a quarter less. It's flashing E. And, and then we do not have the love to uh, love on our spouses or boyfriend, girlfriend, friends, coworkers, teammates. Not the way that we should, but what if? What if your love cup was overflowing all the time? What if you and I were living in under the Niagara Falls? You ever seen pictures of that? You ever been out there? You're living under the Niagara Falls of God's love, holding up your red solo cup. Any worries that that's going to ever run dry? Any worries that that's ever going to be empty? That, if anything, is an underestimation of the love that God pours out, is willing to pour out, is pouring out on you. And when we realize that, our love cup runneth, my cup runneth over. Remember the 23rd Psalm? That's what it means. It means my need for it to be filled, my quickness in pouring it out, can never be faster than the amount of love God is pouring in. So you're never loving for love, you're loving from love. And that keeps us from being insecure. God loves you so much. And if you knew how much, everything would change. So that's what we do every, every week. It's not like a light switch where I didn't know and now I know. No, it just clicks a little brighter and a little 
That's why we stick around. That's why we come here. That's why we press into God. That's why we spend time with Him in His Word every day. That's why we pray. It's so that we can know more and just keep clicking at the next and life gets better and more joyful and fuller no matter what's going on. Okay, so this is what Scripture backs that up. 1 John 4, 16. So we have come to know experientially, not just in our noggins, and believe with all that we are the love that God has for us. That, that's our goal. Like, that's where we're going, right? God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God. God abides in him, abides in her. That's what it is. Live in that. Dwell in that. Focus on that. Everything changes, and you'll be protected. Number three, you don't have to count on this life to satisfy your deepest desires, and never do you ever have to have FOMO. What does FOMO mean? Come on, help us. Lexi, say it loud and proud. Fear of missing out. How much does that fuel the things we do, are anxious about, try to do? If I don't go here, if I don't go there, if I don't do this, if I don't, I'm, my life is going to be poorer. I will miss out. God has a solution for that, and it is your assurance of salvation. You don't have to count on this life to satisfy your deepest desires. And you know this. You know this. Even the greatest vacation, when it is over, doesn't stop you from needing and wanting the next one. Does it not? Even the greatest meal that has ever been prepared and enjoyed, which is, these are good things, but it's still the next day leaves you hungry. Even the, the most exciting and thrilling experience when it's over, makes you compare every other experience and, and enjoy it less by comparison, right? And, and you need more and more of the same thing. Look, um, in my full-time job, I manage the, uh, and run the Western Foundation where people give for scholarships and other things. And because of this job, I have developed friendships with billionaires. Um, and I will tell you that even people who can buy and go and do anything that they want, literally. Those who do not know Jesus Christ still think that their next purchase, their next acquisition, their next experience is going to satisfy them in a way that nothing they have ever had or accumulated has satisfied them before. And it doesn't because it can't. Only Jesus satisfies. And guess what? You have him if you're saved. You will always have him and he will have you. Only Jesus satisfies. And that dissatisfaction with everything else, even if it's just a tinge, it just didn't quite, that's a gift. Do you understand why? Because if he allowed us to be deeply and fully satisfied with anything short of him, we would settle for that. So even the best things don't satisfy. And here we go. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He's not talking about carbs and, and water and, and proteins. He's talking about your deepest desires. Only I satisfy. And I satisfy deeply. And you've got that. You can have that right now in a way that billionaires don't experience. Even when they helicopter off to a place that you and I are not allowed in and do th Deep, deep satisfaction. Well, that carries you through every moment of every day of this life. But what about the FOMO? What about the foam? Huh, if I don't do this, my life's going to be empty and I'm going to die without having checked this box or gone here or bucket lifted this. Or... Here's what the Word of God promises us. What no eye has seen, no ear has heard, which means it's better. No, nor the heart of man or woman imagined is what God has prepared for those who love Him. That's the truth. You will miss out on nothing because eternity is guaranteed for you in Christ. And do you understand the peace that comes thinking? There's not pressure on me to have to go this place and do this thing. And do, and do you know what? It allows me 
and you to enjoy the things that we do do and the people we are with more, not less, because we're not looking to them to do that which only Jesus can do. We're not putting a weight on them that crushes them. Going on vacation with your parents, like, you're going to have a fun time now, darn it. Right? Yeah. You don't have to put that pressure on. Okay. Here we go. Number four or five. You can never lose anything of eternal value. That's helpful. And you can lose anything without being devastated or destroyed. Anything. I'd like to introduce you to a man named John Chrysostom who preached the gospel in the 4th century. And he crossed ways with an empress called Eudoxia. And she threatened him with banishment if he insisted on preaching the gospel. He said, you cannot banish me for this world is my father's house. And she said, but then I will kill you, said the empress. He said, no, you cannot. For my life is hid with Christ and God, said John. I will take away your treasures. Well, you can't do that. For my treasure is in heaven and my heart is there. But I will drive you away from your friends and family. You'll have no one left. He says, no, you cannot. I have a friend and family and father in heaven from whom you cannot separate me. I defy you, for there is nothing you can do to harm me. There is nothing you can take from me that God, that Christ does not hold secure. And John Chrysostom knew this and the Apostle Paul knew this and you and I can know this. Here it is. This is why, Paul writes, I am suffering here in prison, but I am not ashamed and I am not down for I know the one whom I trust. Do you know the one that you trust? The more you know him, the more you will trust him. And I get this. I am sure. I am certain. I, this is on a rock and it ain't moving. That Jesus is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. Which means you can lose nothing that you have entrusted to Christ. And anything that you have given over to him, you can never lose. Do you remember his words? Whoever loses his life and her life for my sake will find it and everybody who clings to it and saves it will lose it. Everything that you surrender to Christ, he keeps secure. You can lose nothing. And that means that we are down when we lose people and things, but we're not devastated because nothing of eternal value is lost when it is entrusted to Christ. Number five. Your suffering is always understood and shared. Some of you are going through things now that cause you deep pain. Some of you have shared them with me. Some of you have chosen not to. That's okay. But do you understand that when you are assured of your relationship with Christ, when you wear the helmet of salvation, when you have assurance of salvation, your suffering is always understood and always shared. One of my favorite pastors, Tim Keller, teaches that the truth that Jesus is the only God who has wounds, who has suffered for you. He's the only one who can say, I understand. I've been there. I've felt it. I've experienced it. I've walked through it. And I will walk through it again with you. And I will carry your pain as I carry you. He's the only God who could say, I understand. Look at the cross where he became everything wrong with every one of us and paid the price. He understands. He was shredded physically. But that does not even compare to what happened spiritually when the Father turned his face away because he became sin and then rose again, defeating it. Every other faith has a, a God, small g, who can never say to you in your pain, I've been there and I understand. Only Jesus. Because Jesus is the only God with wounds. And that means you're not alone in your pain and your suffering. Paul says, for we, as we share between us abundantly Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we also share 
with Him abundantly in His comfort too. The God who hurt for you will hurt with you. Sometimes what you really need, what I really need in our deepest moments of pain is for somebody who has been through the same thing and to say, I get it. I understand. And you know they do. And they're never going to leave you. That's what you got. That's what you got. Your suffering is always understood and shared. Author Ian Jugard wrote, Suppose tomorrow you receive two letters. In one you receive the news that your great Auntie Frida in Australia has died and left you $10 million. While at the same post in the same day, you also receive a parking ticket that was going to cost you $100. Which of those two letters is going to shape your day? The sure and certain hope of $10 million or the present depressing reality of the $100 fine? If you're anything like me, he writes, there are plenty of times when the present $100 crisis easily wins out. When you and I put on the helmet of assured salvation, we always let the better letter win. You've gotten the better letter. So let it win. Every time. Every time. So to wear the helmet of salvation, you have to know beyond the shadow of the doubt that you can be saved. You say, can I know that? Yes, you can. John, Jesus' close, closest friend on earth, with, I write these things to, know, to you who believe, who believe deeply in the name of the Son of God, Jesus, that you may know that you have eternal life. God wants you to know. Not think, not hope, no. And to walk in that reality and all the beautiful things that that entails. You can know. And Jesus is the way that you can know. Jesus wore a crown of thorns for me, for you, so that he could be my helmet of salvation. There are two groups of people here, of which I am in one. One is the people who long for but can't enjoy or experience any of these benefits because they've walked right up to the line of salvation but have not received that gift for themselves. And that can change for you. The other group, of which I am a part, not, not as a, a proud thing, I, I, I spent a lot of time in that other group, right? The other one is people who don't fully know the beauty and depth and breadth and power of their assurance of salvation and have never put it on, not fully, not, not to the point where it protects and, and guards our hearts and our minds in Christ and brings us that peace, that joy, that, that security. And regardless of what group you're in, Jesus wants to change that right now as he calls you home. So we can all be in and all discover and experience. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's receive. Lord, you are so good. You are far better than even the most wild dreams that we have of how good you could be. And Lord, we want you. We want to experience you. There's those uh, friends of mine who have walked right up to, they know about you and they don't have that assurance of salvation or all of these beautiful things that you want to do for them and in them and, and protect them because they never feel, fully receive the gift. Well, well, today is that day. And I invite you, if you're, if you're in that group, just make these words your prayer, your heart cry to God. God, Jesus... I don't want to be on the other side. I want to be in with you. I know that I need you. I have tried every way to run my life in, in, in the best way, and, and I fail miserably. And I'm, I'm left with an emptiness that, that I wonder if it can ever be filled. And I know and I believe that you are the answer. The Lord, forgive me to fill me, to, 
to guide me, to hold me, to walk me through life and into life, and even when this life is done. Lord, I invite you. I acknowledge you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe you came for me. I believe you, you died for me. I believe you rose for me. And I believe that in you, I have everything. I have everything. Lord, I surrender completely to you and receive your free gift. Save me. And there are others. Lord, we, we, we know that what you've done. We know where we're going, but we don't have the full reality of all that entails, all the blessings and beautiful things that you want to pour over us and, and cover our minds with. And right now, we want, to, we want you to plant them in our hearts that we don't live for acceptance. We live from acceptance. We don't live for love. Lord, we want to be uh, the, you're, you're under your Niagara Falls of your love. Lord, we don't want to look for this world to satisfy our deepest desires. Only you satisfy Lord, we don't want to ever fear the loss of anything of eternal value. We want to entrust everything to you. And Lord, finally, we want to know that in our deepest, darkest times of suffering that you understand and that you share it. And Lord, we want to put on the helmet of salvation to protect our minds from lies that would rob us of the joy and the peace of dwelling on you and how good you are. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, you and I will celebrate the meal of the assurance of salvation. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he had dinner with his friends. And he took bread and he thanked his Father in heaven, and he broke the bread. And, and he gave it to his friends, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. For you. Take it and eat it. Let it become part of you. And when you do, remember. Remember. Focus on, dwell on me and my love for you. When supper was ended, Jesus took a cup and again, he thanked his Father in heaven. He gave the cup to his friends and he said to them, this is the cup of my blood, which I shed for you and, and for all people, many of whom don't know it yet, so that sins may be forgiven, washed away. Take this and drink it and, and let it become part of you, right? And when you do, remember, remember me. Remember my love for you. Focus on that. This meal is for you if you wear the helmet of salvation, if you receive that gift. It doesn't matter if you come to this church or if you're Baptist or Methodist or Lutheran or Catholic or some mutt like me, right? Or nothing. You just know that you belong to Jesus and he belongs to you. This is your meal. But if not, if you're not there yet, don't, don't do this. There'll be time to celebrate that when, when you cross the line. And if you need help doing that, I sit on that back row. Come sit with me. I'm happy to help. I'm happy to pray with you. Jesus asks us to do three things before we celebrate this. Remember, repent. Just turn over to Him and confess anything that you need forgiven. And receive. It's all that He's done for us. I love you.
Christ is my reward all the mighty devotion now there's nothing in this world that can ever satisfy through every trial my soul will sing no turning back I've been set free Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Christ, my all in all. The joy of my salvation And this hope will never fail Heaven is my own Through every storm My soul will sing Jesus is here To God be the glory and Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. And everything I need is in you. Everything I need. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided, and I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. And I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. No turning back. Let's sing Christ. And Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. And everything I need is in you. You're everything I need. have my deepest needs and desires fed and satisfied. One day when I get in this relationship, when I get out of this relationship, when I move here or do that or attain this or achieve, no, not one day, two day. And only Jesus can satisfy and he will and wants to. Put on the helmet that covers your thoughts that the goodness of God and everything will change I love you thank you if you want to come up and sign up for the gas buy down volunteering or just try on the vest I get it alright you do that we got a great lunch for you stay I love you